In this presentation, we're going to go over and learn to identify the common hand tools associated with working on small gas engines, whether we're assembling, disassembling, troubleshooting these engines. Um, this is by no means the comprehensive list of all tools we have available to us, um, but these are the common tools that we have at our shop at LSU that you might find in a high school ag shop or at a home shop situation. So our, our one um, educational objective associated with what we're going to try to do today is to identify these common tools associated with small gas engines, and we'll also discuss um, a little bit of their usage. Let's begin by discussing the various types of wrenches that we may have available to us um, in our shops. Wrenches are probably, in the small engine world, likely one of our more important tools. Um, I know with our engines, um, the Briggs 950 series, with uh, an 8, 10, 12, and 13 millimeter wrench or a socket, you can pretty much take um, 85 plus percent of the, percent of the engine apart. Um, we'll start with, with with tools that probably look familiar to us, but we'll, t we'll talk about their names real quick. Um, we'll begin with a combination wrench up here. This, uh, this wrench is, is called combination because it's got the combination of the, the open end and the box end wrench. It makes it a very handy tool. Um, we can utilize the open end wrench um, to, to loosen um, nuts and bolts um, in, in pretty tight um, situations or the box end wrench um, is very useful for those those more stubborn bolts. Your typical open end wrench um, is, is named so because it has just two open ends, usually um, two different sizes makes it handy. You can have one tool um, that, can, that can handle two different size um, nuts or bolts. Um, similarly, we have the, the box end wrench, which is got uh, two box ends, usually two different sizes, is very good when we kind of have those, those stubborn, stubborn bolts. Very common in our world in small engines are, are torque wrenches. These are going to be used um, to measure, um, typically in a small engine world, the, the inch pounds of torque, and we'll talk about torque um, a little bit later on um, as, as we move through the rest of the semester, but torque is is basically a measurement of, of energy or motion in a, a rotation. So this will tell us how many inch pounds of, of force we're exerting on a bolt. Um, and it's measured on ours and our shop at LSU. We have the, the dial or the, the arm bar that is right here that basically um, as we put force on it, it bends and shows us where we're, where we're torquing to. The other common style are the click style. Um, they're typically uh, more expensive, nicer torque wrenches, and you set the inch pounds or feet pounds, depending on the, the type of wrench that you want. And when you achieve that, that measurement, it clicks and lets you know that, that you're there. Very common are also our ratchets and our sockets, typically um, also called socket wrenches. Uh, they do this the very similar job as our wrenches above, um, except um, we're actually going to place one of these sockets here onto the ratchet here and we don't have to take the wrench off like we will with open or box end wrench when we're loosening or tightening a bolt. Sometimes we can get a little more leverage because they're a little bit longer. Um, sometimes they're more specially. Typically our spark plug wrenches are um, um, a deep well type socket like this with a piece of rubber in it that lets us um, take the socket out or, or install it in the engine without breaking the porcelain piece. You'll also notice that at the very top here, you can see different points. This one looks like it's probably a 12-point socket versus a six-point socket. Um, that's going to come into play, especially if you have some stubborn or rusty bolts. Um, usually, we'll want to use something more like a six-point socket with has less chances of, round, of rounding off like a 12-point socket would. Um, and then, obviously, this one's a deep well, so you may have, so if you were to actually have some of your bolt sticking up like this, um, you know, this is your, the head of the bolt down here, and then you wouldn't be able to, or the nut actually down here, you wouldn't be able to get um, a, a shallow socket on it. Let's see. Um, next, we have the adjustable wrench. I know most people are looking at it, well, that's a crescent wrench. And, you know, that's kind of like if we talk about in the world of science, our, our common name versus scientific name. Crescent's actually a brand. Everybody calls it a crescent wrench, but Technically, it's an adjustable wrench. If you buy a Craftsman um, wrench that looks like this, it's going to say adjustable and not crescent wrench on it because that's, that's a trademarked or copyrighted brand name. 
Um, it looks like I skipped the strap wrench real quick. Um, this is going to be used in our situations for um, tightening or, or removing a flywheel. Um, and, and that's going to be able to utilize the strap here and put around a large object like a flywheel and be able to take that off and on. And lastly, in our world of, of wrenches, we're going to have our hex keys or our Allen wrenches. Again, kind of like the crescent wrench versus adjustable wrench. Allen is the, the brand name versus hex head key or hex wrench. Um, the, the tips obviously have six sides, and we, we're probably pretty familiar with those and, and their applications where we need to use the Allen wrenches or the hex keys um, when working on our engines. After wrenches, our drivers are probably going to be one of our more important or most commonly used tools when we're working on engines. Um, you're probably pretty familiar with drivers. Typically, we call them screwdrivers. And almost always when we think of screwdrivers, we're going to think first of our flat or our standard, um, which is one of the oldest style of drivers available to us. Less likely that we're, we're going to see flat-headed or slotted-head screws on, a, on an engine, especially if they're more modern. Um, sometimes we'll see the situation where we can use um, the flat-bladed screwdriver to help remove a fuel line um, for a little bit of leverage. Um, a little bit more common, um, especially maybe with older engines, you might see something in the world of, of Phillips head or even a combination Phillips slash slotted head. Um, so that's kind of got the, the old cross look to it. More commonly is going to be a Torx bit. And they're going to be more common for, for several reasons. And the biggest really actually reason, really only one, one reason, is the star shape that we have of the Torx bit. It um, is a lot more difficult to, to strip these, these screw heads out um, than, than the Phillips or, or the flat head. And, and, well, the Phillips head is, is very easy to strip out, and the flat head can sometimes be um, a little bit of a pain to keep in place, if we're, especially if we're trying to really put some, um, some torque onto a screw head. That's where the, the, the star bit or the Torx head is really the correct name, really shines. I, always, I tell students here at LSU um, who are, are majoring ag ed, uh, one of the first things that you can do to help keep a little bit of your sanity is to convert everything you do in, in any aspect of your shop, especially if it's a, especially a woodworking situation, to a Torx, um, Torx bits and Torx headed screws. After those three, those three drivers are really kind of um, focusing on screws or, um, or machine bolts, we have our, our nut drivers. And these are going to come in um, various sizes and kind of think of these as the, the offspring of the screwdrivers and, and wrenches. These are going to be used to tighten and loosen hex headed bolts and screws. And um, they're very handy when working on small engines, as can be the offset driver. Um, and you can see why it's offset here. It's really nice um, when you have a kind of a tight space to get into to have an offset driver. Lastly, I put bits on here. Um, this particular square headed bit is probably going to be used more if we're talking about electricity. Those of you that are in my class at LSU probably can remember using this um, when we're working with some of our receptacles. Um, so probably not the square head in an engine sense, but since, but just um, talking about bits in general, you can get anything above that we talked about um, up here in a various bit that we can use in either a, a manual driver handle or even a, a power driver situation. Pliers um, are going to be another very common tool that we're going to see in our engine shop. Now, um, pliers are really not a great choice to, to use to tighten or loosen hex-headed bolts because they really like to, to round those heads off, and then you can end up with a bigger problem. Um, but normal pliers that we kind of think of are typically slip joint pliers. These are handy um, when we're working with fuel lines as far as taking um, the, the, the brass hose clamps off and on. They're really handy with that. Um, locking pliers. You can see I also put in vice grips, kind of like earlier we talked about Crescent Wrench. Vice grips is the brand. The, the tool is called locking pliers. Again, it's, it probably doesn't matter that much, but just to just so you know, um, if you go buy a uh, go to Sears and buy Craftsman, you're not buying. You won't see vice grips in the Craftsman world. Let's say locking pliers. These are useful. I uh, sometimes use these to clamp off fuel lines. If you still may have gas in an engine, you can use it for that. Uh, it can help you get a positive, a really good hold on something that you're trying to to turn with a wrench. Um, ring pliers or retaining ring pliers. This is kind of a specialty plier that's going to be used um, when we're working with retaining rings, putting them off and on. Um, small engines, 
Um, you can, you'll probably, I can't think of, of any of these type style rings on our 950 series. I know I use these when I work on um, ag equipment. If there's something with a drive shaft, there's typically a, um, um, a locking um, ring that, that helps hold your U-joints in place. Um, we also have, again, the, the, the real name versus the brand name, tongue and groove pliers. Everyone in the world calls these channel locks, and that's fine, but just know channel locks, again, is the brand name of the, of the folks that really made that wrench popular. It's going to be similar to the slip joint pliers that you can adjust the jaws um, and really get a good grip on it, um, but maybe not quite as um, to, the, to the point of getting a grip like you would with like a, a pipe wrench, which isn't on here. Um, and then the last one are going to be our needle nose pliers. And sometimes you'll also see needle nose pliers that are kind of a combination needle nose and cutting. This one here does not have the, the cutting jaws on it. Um, this will help if you're trying to work in tight places where you can't get the normal slip joint pliers into them. It's important to understand um, the various measuring tools that we may have available to us in a small engine shop. Um, typically, most of these measuring tools are going to be used for engines that hey, may have a little bit more wear and tear on them. Lots of times we're working with, with newer engines, and so um, we're not really measuring outside of tolerances. I included the steel tape up here at the beginning kind of just to, to give us a, a, a comparison um, to, to a, a tool that we're familiar with from the the rest of the semester. The, the remainder of the, the measuring tools up here are either more what we refer to as a specialty measuring tool or a precision measuring tool. The first is up here in the corner is the micrometer. This is going to measure at a lot more exacting tolerances that we could ever begin to get with with a steel tape. Um, this is going to be used for um, measuring wear on things like the like a drive shaft, make sure we're still in, in, in the correct tolerances and it's going to measure very, very detailed. Um, as is the vernier caliper. We can measure inside and outside diameters. This is used to measure the diameter of a cylinder bore. It can be used to measure the diameter of bolts. It's used in a, a lot of, of situations. Um, some of the ones we have in, in our shop are digital and they make life a little bit easier. I'll do a video later on, um, on that's going to show us how to actually read a manual vernier caliper. Um, it's not overly difficult, but it, it is not nearly as straightforward as measuring and reading a, a steel tape. A little bit more specialty tools related to small gas engines. The first is going to be a feeler gauge. Um, we use this often in, in work, when working on small engines. Um, typically, we're going to use this when we're measuring uh, valve clearance so that we get our valve set correctly. We'll talk about what that means a little later on. Um, we can also measure spark plug gaps with these. And then the final measuring tool that I'm including are tachometers. I've got a digital and a manual version here to kind of show you the two different um, styles, but they do the same thing. And these are going to be just like the tachometer in your car or truck. They're going to measure the, the, the RPMs or the revolutions per minute of that small gas engine. Next, we'll discuss a few um, engine specific tools that, that we may not see in a normal um, toolbox if, if we're not um, working on engines pretty regularly. The first will be a piston ring compressor. This is the Bridge & Stratton version. Um, up here, this is the ring compressor. You actually will loose, use this tool here to loosen the ring compressor up here, and this will expand, and we put this around the piston with and the rings, and then we tighten it back down so that we can get the piston with the rings on it back into the cylinder bore. Um, next is a cylinder hone. This is going to be used typically when we have maybe a freshly bored out engine and we need to smooth the, the sidewalls down or maybe we had a ring break and left some, some scars and scuffing. We can utilize this tool to, to smooth down the, the interior walls of our cylinder um, so that we don't create um, a situation where we have excess friction and friction creates heat and then that's just um, kind of a, a bad situation. Um, next is the spark tester, probably one of the most underutilized tools, I think, in my opinion, in, when we're talking about small engines. Um, this tool right here is going to be um, used to test our, our, our spark plug, basically, and also our, our magneto armature. Um, this is going to be placed in the spark plug holder, and we can then actually attach this to anything that's grounded 
or the spark plug itself to see if it's working correctly. Um, many of you may be sitting out there thinking, well, why can't I just pull the spark plug out and set it against something metal that's grounded and, and pull on my recoil starter? And you can do that. I've done that plenty of times, and, and that's, that's a way that we've, we've tested spark plugs a long time. Um, but that isn't always foolproof. Um, we can pull the, the spark plug out, and we can see a spark if we're, we have it outside the engine. But what happens inside of the engine is different than what happens when we're pulling on that cord um, in a normal, you know, situation where we have it against the block um, to see if there's a spark. And that's going to have to do with the differences in atmospheric pressure versus what the way air and the fuel air mix acts in the combustion chamber um, when it's under compression. We'll talk more about that lately, but there are plenty of instances where people have ha actually have a spark plug that is, is no longer good, meaning it won't fire under compression, but you pull it out and you lay it against the engine block, you can see a spark jumping, but then you put it back in, you still can't get your engine to start. And you can see that can be a, a, a maddening process where we kind of get, get stuck in a loop of, I'm pulling the spark plug out, I see there's spark, I put it back in, but I still can't get this engine to run. And and really, what is happening is our spark um, is is too weak to jump the gap under under compressed air. Speaking of compression, our final tool on this page is actually our compression tester, and this is going to be a tool we'll use to verify that we have the proper amount of compression in our engine. Um, this rubber tip is simply kind of just shoved into. Um, the, the hole where we would insert our spark plug and then either you or somebody else, it's easier if this is a two-person job, um, will we'll pull the recoil starter and this needle will move up into the, the right area and show you how many PSI uh, of pressure you have when that cylinder moves up to top dead center. Or piston rather moves to top dead center. All right, the last few tools that we'll talk about today um, that are engine specific are, we'll begin with our valve spraying compressor. Um, there are instances in, in especially older style, style um, engines where we need to use this tool where we'll actually put the, the valve spring here and then tighten it down to compress it to get it back into place. And we see a lot of that in your overhead valve, or not your overhead valve engines like we're using in our, in our class, but some of the flathead or L-head engines um, that, that it was very common. Um, these, those springs are pretty stout and it, you're, it's gonna be not impossible, but pretty difficult to do that without a specialty tool um, to, to help you out. This next tool is the Briggs and Stratton flywheel puller. There are several different types of flywheel pullers. A lot, if you know what a gear puller is, some look like that. This particular one um, is Briggs related and you insert this um, over the, the, the shaft and these bolts will then screw into some pre-drilled, pre-threaded holes into the flywheel and simply lift it up. Um, they work great when they work great and they're frustrating when the holes aren't drilled correctly. Um, next to the flywheel holder, um, on our air-cooled engines, the flywheel have fins to push air around the motor to keep it cooled and this flywheel holder will hold those fins right here so that we can turn the flywheel or turn the crankshaft, do whatever we need to do um, without it spinning. Um, the last tool that we're going to talk about is the fuel line tool. This is little more than, than a, a, a bar with a couple of bins and some slots cut out of it, but it can sure help a lot when we're trying to remove uh, rubber fuel lines um, from uh, brass fittings. Now, I know that, that often, you know, in our contest engines, they might be worn or even um, drilled out a little bit to make that easier, but a brand new engine, um, or one that, that's never had the fuel line off, it can be a little bit frustrating to get that fuel line off without ripping it, and this tool helps with that tremendously.